Ah, the movies that pay tribute to the legacy of the Beatles, from the good to the less good to the whatever the hell this is. For over four decades, filmmakers have taken inspiration from the greatest band of all time, and they've made musicals, mockumentaries, and monstrosities. That's right, I'm back on my bullshit, and today I'm gonna break down the films that utilize the Beatles' story and music, and let you know which ones to watch and which ones to stay away from forever. This is sort of a quasi-sequel to my first video on this channel, where I watched and reviewed every Beatles biopic. I'll link it up top if you wanna check it out. And yes, I did pronounce it biopic, because I had just a few of you. <laughs> point out that I was uh, pronouncing it wrong. Biopic, 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 biopic. I mean, some of you guys really got upset by this. I mean, like, Jesus Christ, are you okay? It's Leviosa. But seriously, thank you to everyone who left a comment and shared something cool. I'm pretty new on here, so I really appreciate it because it truly helps out the channel. I read every single comment and learned a ton of cool stuff from you guys, like that Oedipal stuff from Noah Boy. Totally a thing. There's like tapes of John Lennon talking about literally doing this scene in real life. Just remembering the time when I had my hand on my mother's f when I was about 14. I was lying on the bed and I was thinking, I wonder if I should uh, do anything else. You know? I mean, yeah, wow. Okay, so the movies that made it to my list of Beatles biopics had to meet the criteria of taking place at least at some point while the Beatles were still a band. But even then, a bunch of you couldn't believe that I left one film in particular off that list. And that film is Two of Us. Like a lot of you. Like a lot of you. Seriously, you'll freaking love this film. So before I dive into the bulk of the content of today's video, I thought I'd share my thoughts on what many of you consider to be the best Beatles biopic, VH1's Two of Us from the year 2000. And while you're here, hit subscribe so you can see more of my stuff in future. So another reason I didn't include this film in my previous video is because it's largely based on fiction. Right at the beginning of the film, there's a written statement that points out that it's entirely fictional and makes no attempt to recreate real events, and is more of a celebration of what John and Paul gave us. Two of Us takes place during a single day in April 1976, six years after the breakup of the Beatles, and although it only depicts John and Paul and not George or Ringo, I think through the intimate two-hander narrative, you actually get a better sense of what it was like for them during their heyday, as the two reflect on the most significant period in their lives and what brought them to where they are now. The film opens with Paul being interviewed on TV, with the host asking if the Beatles will ever reunite, with McCartney telling him, you never know. The remainder of the film is structured very much like a three-act play, where Act 1 sees Paul drop in on John at his Dakota apartment in New York while he's on tour with Wings. What follows are a series of long conversations between John and Paul, from discussing what George and Ringo are up to... So you seen much of the others lately? The other Beatles? Beatle George rang up just the other day. I'm supposed to go into the studio with uh, Beatle Ringo next week. I haven't heard from George in a while, but I talk to Ringo pretty often. To Paul's decision to make music and tour while John lives a quiet life at home, to the two of them sharing a joint and playing piano together. Drifting along with the tumbling tumbleweeds. Keep on drifting. Paul meets John's son Sean over the phone. John and Paul have a meditation session together to finally an argument brought on by the discussion of what caused the band to fall apart in the first place. If you couldn't deal with Yoko, you had no business dealing with me. You turned your back on us, remember? I felt like I was losing my best mate. Who? Which makes Paul go to leave. Act two opens with Paul deciding to turn back to confront John before they work it out and decide to go for a walk together. This is where, in disguise, they start to have a bit more fun as they stumble across some reggae musicians in Central Park and have a close run-in with the cops. You have a problem with authority, pal? No, sir. Officer Knight! Meeting fans in restaurants and on the street prompts them to share how things like fame and fatherhood have affected them. You're a lucky man, Paul. Got a whole stable full of healthy kids. And even briefly discuss band on the run. Even the press? Seems to like me for once. What? They like Band on the Run. Oh yeah, they did, yeah, they liked that one. Band on the Run was a great album. Act 3 concludes with the two of them sharing a cigarette on John's rooftop and getting to the heart of John's inner turmoil as Paul comforts him. We then see them falling asleep on the couch watching Saturday Night Live. It's here that we witness the event that inspired the film and the only sequence that's based on a real life story as told by both John and Paul. Lorne Michaels, producer of the famous sketch show, talks directly to camera and makes a plea to the Beatles to come on the show and reunite for a comical $3,000 fee. 
want to give Ringo less, that's up to you. Oh, oh that's good. Oh, that's that's dead dead me. I'd rather not I love Ringo. <laughs> Little did the world know that John and Paul were watching and in a spur of the moment decision decided to go down and surprise the world by showing up and playing a few songs. At the last minute, the two decided not to and the world was left with the achingly close reality of the most famous musicians in the world almost reuniting for what would be one of the most iconic moments in televised history. <sighs> Could you imagine? So what actually happened was that Lorne Michaels plea that was broadcast happened a week earlier when John was watching by himself. And then the following Saturday when Paul was over, John approached Paul with the idea of going down. But that's what we're left with, this longing for what could have been between the two. This real life sequence in a story of fiction works really well here as the whole film is propped up by an exceptional screenplay, quality direction and fascinating performances. As soon as the film starts you can already tell that stylistically it has a lot more going for it than many of the other biopics. Beatles historian Martin Lewis worked as the film's technical advisor and in an impressive turn of events Let It Be director Michael Lindsay Hogg agreed to direct the film after reading the screenplay play by a longtime Beatles fanatic, Mark Stanfield. According to IMDb, this is Stanfield's one and only screenplay, which is surprising to me because it's incredibly well done. This movie doesn't feature a single Beatles song in its entire soundtrack, but it shows that it doesn't need it. Because while on the surface, two of us may seem like it's a film about the world's most famous musicians, but what becomes clear is that it's really a story about friendship and loss. We as the audience get to be a fly on the wall as John and Paul, now in their mid-30s, attempt to work out who they now are to each other. That's essentially the entire plot of the film, and because of that, the actors are given so much more room to breathe, and the agency of John, Paul, and the story takes you somewhere far deeper than what you'd normally see in a standard Beatles reenactment film. Instead of being a checklist of notable Beatle milestones like you typically see, this film gets to the heart of what makes John and Paul so diametrically opposed but also shows us how those very differences point to what made their songwriting partnership the success that it was. Paul finds value in bringing joy into people's lives with his music. Who are you really if all you're concerned with is making other people happy? Why can't making people happy be a part of who you are? Whereas John sees the duty of an artist as someone who's meant to wake people up by exposing our collective pain and suffering. There's more than enough pain in the world. So I don't see why you want to go and make it worse. Because it's real, you know, it's not romantic bollocks, mate. You've got to stir people up. You've got to make them uneasy, you know, make them miserable. That's the only way they'll wake up and face reality. These two attitudes, while legitimate on their own, reach a point of diminishing returns. But together, they form our understanding of what made Lennon and McCartney such a perfect union. The light and dark of their own hearts and minds that resulted in the greatest music of the last century. It's also really funny in parts. I'm gonna hand you back to your dad, all right? He likes me music. Yeah, he would. He likes nursery rhymes. Aidan Quinn and Jared Harris do a phenomenal job and prepared extensively for their given roles, with Quinn even venturing to Liverpool with backbeat actor Ian Hart and also visited McCartney's childhood home. Both actors look nothing like either Beatle, but their performances are so detailed and honest and neither are putting on too much of an annoying vocal affectation, which is more than I can say for many, many of these other films. With Aidan Quinn as Paul, it's a perfect example of an actor capturing the essence of a real life person and allowing the character to live in him rather than doing a hammy impression. You know, I'm out there making the rounds, talking to the press. And the one question they inevitably ask, it never fails, is, Paul, will the Beatles be getting back together? You know what I mean? Jared Harris has such a distinct voice that you have to sit with him for a while before you feel like his Lennon truly comes through, but when it does, it's very effective. I've been under contract to one wanker or another since I was 19 years old, you know? I've finally gotten control of my own life. I'm not giving that up and the two enhance each other's performances with their natural chemistry. Their relationship starts off as defensive and awkward in the first act, before their conversations grow more sincere as the relationship between the two becomes more recognisable. This chemistry is something that I think is really commendable about Harris and Quinn's performances. It's something they manage to achieve that almost every other Lennon-McCartney portrayal fails at, which is evoking that unmistakable sense of humour and boyish playfulness that you only find in adults who knew each other as teenagers. John and Paul, and George and Ringo for that matter, spoke almost in their own language a lot of the time. Look Terence, if you want 
wanted to resign from the amateur dramatics, too. It's not that. I put a lot of money and thought into the whole thing. Yeah, but let's face it, you're crap. Well, all right, all right. His father was he got the hole in the first place, yes, eh? you're only doing more cons and you're farting those up. Chinga, chinga, ching, boom, boom, boom. A mix of in-jokes and silly voices that Harris and Quinn managed to recreate in a genuinely authentic way. I said, I was more than that. I was more So, uh... How's Leeds? Top of the division, top of the division, yeah. Yeah, Man yeah, United, yeah. Man United doing well. Oh, very well, very well, yeah. <clears throat> Going down the pub, will you? Can't say pint. The emotional climax of the film occurs on the rooftop where John finally allows himself to be vulnerable in front of Paul. So, I get in my own way to protect myself. Yeah, but it's not always dangerous, you know? Like right now, this moment, I'm not going to do anything to hurt you. I'm not going to leave you. And we arrive at a point of deep catharsis as Paul lets John know how much he's loved and wanted. And I see a frightened man who doesn't realize how beautiful he is. This is what we need more of in future Beatles biopics. Meaningful exchanges and tender moments that don't shy away from showing how much these guys meant to each other. With the exception of Nowhere Boy, Two of Us is my favourite Beatles biopic, even though I don't really think it counts as a proper biopic, which may be why it's so good. It's also the only one that Paul McCartney seemed to enjoy, having told Aidan Quinn when they met by chance on holiday. He also admitted to liking it as late as last year on the Adam Buxton podcast. Did you see a film directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg, who directed the videos for Paperback Writer and Hey Jude, Revolution, called The Two of Us, or just Two of Us? I did see it, actually, yeah. And I mean, I must say, I enjoyed it. I thought I wish that had happened. It didn't happen quite like that. Isn't that nice? He wishes it were like that. I think it's a really successful film and yeah, just go and watch two of us. All right, now onto the main event. The films that aren't biopics, but what I call Beatles adjacent or Beatles tribute films, which I realized after recording this is a much better term. I had to limit what I mean by Beatles tribute. So right up top, no films made by the Beatles like A Hard Day's Night or Help and no Beatles documentaries of which there are far too many to count. Also nothing too broad in scope. Otherwise, next thing you know, I'm sitting here talking about Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales because Paul McCartney is a cameo in it. Jackie boy! So let's get stuck into our first Beatles adjacent film and one that came highly requested by many of you, 1978's documentary spoof, The Ruttles, All You Need Is Cash. A genuinely funny pastiche of the Beatles' entire career, co-written by Neil Innes and Monty Python's Eric Idle, who also co-directed the film. The original concept came from a Beatles parody sketch in Idle's mid-70s BBC television comedy series, Rutland Weekend Television, a running joke on the premise of a TV show broadcasting from a fictional station in Rutland, the smallest county in England. The idea for a film came when Eric Idle appeared on Saturday Night Live and showed the clip to producer Lorne Michaels, who suggested he turn it into a one-hour mockumentary for television. SNL director Gary Weiss agreed to co-direct the film with Idle in order to enhance the feeling that you were watching a genuine documentary. The idea for the film was cemented when Monty Python fan and Beatles member George Harrison I like to be a pirate, a pirate's life for me encouraged Idle and Inez to make a film that would parody the Beatles' career and serve to deflate the myths surrounding the band's legacy. As well as providing ideas, Harrison supplied them both with a copy of the long-planned documentary the Long and Winding Road, which later became the Beatles' anthology. Eric Idle drew inspiration from this 1976 version of the documentary and was granted permission to use archival footage of the Beatles to help tell the Ruttles' story. The film is a series of skits and gags that illustrate the Ruttles' story as a parallel tale to the chronology of the Beatles. Their first album was made in 20 minutes. The second took even longer. Tonight, we examine the legend of the Ruttles. We look at their lives, their loves, their music. We examine some of the problems that made them what they are today. And we shall also be asking some of the people who worked with them whether they were really the sort of lovable people they were made out to be. We should be asking many people who knew them what they were really like. Peppered throughout are interviews with real life celebrities, including many from SNL, but most notably Mick Jagger, who discusses how the Rolling Stones were always competing with the Ruttles when they were both coming up in the early 60s. Because we were the South's answer to the Ruttles, you know, at that time. Mick Jagger is really very funny here. You can see why they keep wanting to use him throughout the film. We tried to write some for the uh, the Rolling Stones and they're probably going to buy them. They ran around the corner to the pub 
to write this song and came back with it and played it to us. And um, it was horrible. And so we never bothered to record it. And the fact that he appears at all greatly enhances the credibility as well. All You Need Is Cash was quite successful in England and later became so popular that the group toured and even released two albums that included a couple of UK chart hits. The real Beatles members were all mostly big fans of the mockumentary, with John Lennon refusing to give back the videotape and soundtrack copy he was given for approval. George Harrison was of course the biggest advocate for the film, having been involved directly from the beginning. Gary Weiss tells the story of sitting around Eric Idle's kitchen with George Harrison, quote, we were sitting around in Eric's kitchen one day, planning a sequence that really ripped into the mythology, and George looked up and said, We were the Beatles, you know. Then he shook his head and said, Oh, never mind. I think it was the only one of the Beatles who could really see the irony of it all. George Harrison later admitted in his own words that the Russells sort of liberated me from the Beatles in a way. It was the only thing I saw of those Beatles television shows they made. It was actually the best, funniest, and most scathing but at the same time, it was done with the most love. I think this is the cornerstone of the film's success and why it's one of the best Beatles adjacent movies that's ever been made. You can tell how much everyone involved truly loves the Beatles and really just wants to honor them. And it really is hilarious and holds up extremely well. The secret source of the film has got to be the soundtrack by Neil Inez, who wrote and composed 19 songs for the soundtrack, each a pastiche of a Beatles song or genre. The soundtrack album even ended up being nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Comedy Recording. The songs are written, performed, and produced with such originality, but at the same time, they honor the songs that they're originally parodying. And this is years before the likes of Weird Al came onto the scene. The guys playing the Russells also impersonate their movements on stage with such sharp accuracy you can immediately tell what Beatles era they're supposed to be parodying. The celebrity cameos are terrific, but by far the best inclusion is George Harrison himself. He addressed as a TV journalist interviewing Michael Palin's Ruttlecore manager and not missing a beat. So, Stig injured by Big Valerie. I really do love how much George Harrison was this just like big comedy fan. Like he funded Life of Brian because he just wanted it to be made. But that's a story for another time. There's so many great jokes as well, of course, with Stig, the parody of George, being the quiet one. So much so that he doesn't have a single line in the entire film. Even as the quiet one, he'd not said a word since 1966. I really want to highlight all my favourite gags, but this would make this already very long video even longer. But here's just a couple. Here, they had bed and breakfast. There's... The bed, the breakfast, of course, long since gone. Rodentally chewed, mouse masticated, in a word, eaten by rats. Shea Stadium, named after the Cuban guerrilla leader, Shea Stadium. The Ruttles next opened a clothes boutique in London, which lost nearly a million dollars in only three weeks before Nasty blew it up. Nasty, in a widely quoted interview, apparently had claimed that the Ruttles were bigger than God, and had gone on to say that God had never had a hit record. Many fans burnt their albums. Many more burnt their fingers attempting to burn their albums. But in fact, it was all a ghastly mistake. Nasty, talking to a slightly deaf journalist, had claimed only that the Ruttles were bigger than Rod. Rod Stewart would not be big for another eight years. In 2002, Eric Idle made the Ruttles 2 Can't Buy Me Lunch, released two years later, but honestly, I wouldn't bother with it. The film contains no new Ruttles footage, only unseen clips from previous movies, and relies too heavily on the huge amount of celebrity cameos from the likes of Robin Williams, Tom Hanks, Steve Martin, and Jimmy Fallon doing his usual interrupting celebrities bit. Made them so successful. And it was a Can you believe this guy? Oh, the hairstyles! These appearances don't really hit the same as the original film, where those cameos actually felt more integral to the telling of the story. But anyway, if you're a fan of musical mockumentaries like This Is Spinal Tap, well this was made six years earlier and really gives it a run for its money, so definitely check it out. It's the very first mockumentary. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it was, it was... amazing. <sighs> out of all the films I've watched that have to do with the Beatles, Nothing prepared me for the unholy, sacrilegious disaster that is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Even just calling a film that is blasphemy in my book. This is not only the worst Beatles film, it's a contender for worst movie ever made. I could almost do a whole video dissecting just how abhorrent each and every component of this sorry excuse for a film is, but 
I don't want to put anyone else through that. Ah, oh, where do I even begin with this film? It was loosely adapted from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band On The Road, a 1974 off-Broadway show that ran for 66 performances. The film was written by Henry Edwards, a dude that just does not have a Wikipedia page and has one single other writing credit on IMDb. Which explains a hell of a lot, because among the many horrible things about this film, the script and story have got to be one of the worst factors. It's essentially about a band, a lonely hearts club band, if you will, led by Billy Shears, the son of original band leader, you guessed it, Sergeant Pepper. Billy Shears. Billy Shears, played by Peter Frampton, and I'll try not to sing out of and the rest of his bandmates, who were all brothers, played by the Bee Gees, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Do you need play together in the all-American town of Heartland, and one day Big Deal Records invite them to Hollywood with the promise of a sex and drugs induced record deal. While they're gone, Mr. Mustard arrives in Heartland in his computer and robot equipped van, FVB. With orders to steal the band's musical instruments. Why? Unclear. You also know that he's the villain because he's labelled it right on the screen. Mr. Mustard is apparently a demented ex-real estate agent. Well, to be fair, I do think most real estate agents are villains. Essentially, he's here to take over Heartland because he hates love and loves money? <laughs> The characters truly don't go beyond the most base archetypes. Meanwhile, Billy Shears lover, Strawberry Fields, ugh, steals Mustard's van and uses it to locate the stolen instruments. One of which is with Steve Martin doing his little shop of horror shtick 10 years before that film came out. Bang, bang, Maxwell Silver Another instrument is with cult leader Father Son, played by Alice Cooper, who, according to IMDb trivia, checked himself into a New York City rehab facility for alcoholism, which he quickly discovered was more of a mental asylum. He was then granted a temporary leave for three days to record and shoot his scenes for this film. Jesus Christ. Remember when Because was this heavenly Beatles song filled with gorgeous harmonies? Because the world is round. It turns me on. Not anymore. It makes the boat riding Willy Wonka look like the fucking Teletubbies. Love is all. Love is you. So the instruments are gone still and Heartland starts to deteriorate. Yes, a dirty old man. And so the record deal guy, whose name isn't a Beatles song, so he'll remain nameless, organizes a benefit where Earth, Wind and Fire play. They're not playing another band, by the way. It's just the real Earth, Wind and Fire as themselves performing. So while everyone's vibing to this, Mustard steals the van with the recovered instruments and also Strawberry, who he inexplicably falls in love with over a fucking predatory version of When I'm 64. Will you still need me? Will you still feel me? Oh, when I'm oh, look, I'm sorry for showing you this. <laughs> but I, I need others to shoulder the burden of this film existing. Also, when I made my previous Beatles biopic video, no one in the comments asked me to mention this film. You're all getting that as a bonus. It's just a little treat I'm giving you. Oh, okay, we're in the final act now. So FVB stands for Future Villain Band. Future Villain Band, which again, way to signpost who we're rooting against in this film, guys. Super original name. And this band is played by Aerosmith, clearly not playing themselves. A much cooler looking band than the super lame Sergeant Peppers. Future Villain Band is described as the evil force that would poison young minds, pollute the environment, and subvert the democratic process. I <laughs> love the idea of Aerosmith just out there suppressing the vote and gerrymandering the district of Heartland. Oh my god. So anyway, they play Come Together on the super tall stage made of giant stacks of money where they've chained up Strawberry to turn her into a mindless groupie, which I'm sorry, but she kind of already was. Like her sole purpose in the film is following either one band or another. She's a groupie. Like way to up the stakes at the 11th hour guys with the most basic of threats. Then Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees turn up and get into a brawl with Aerosmith. Sorry, I just think it's funny if I use their real names. Peter Frampton punches Steven Tyler off the stage. Then this fucking idiot faints at the side of it. And despite being chained to the top of the podium, somehow manages to fall off and die. And then later on the front page, it says she sacrificed herself for Heartland. How? So anyway, the town holds a super elaborate funeral for Strawberry and Peter Frampton is just super depressed despite the Bee Gees patting him on the back.
and he attempts suicide by jumping off a building, which is insane that three central characters should die in the same fashion. But then out of fucking nowhere, the deus ex machina in the form of Sergeant Pepper coming back to life, zaps him back to safety. <laughs> Billy Preston plays Sergeant Pepper and is just zapping shit left and right, turning people into nuns and monks, and I have no fucking idea why. Oh, and he also just brings back Strawberry to life, because why the hell not at this point? The fact that Billy Preston was involved in this project is insane. He was a musician that was actually involved with the Beatles, and is one of two people in the world to share recording credits with the band. The film ends with a bunch of celebrities, is that Noel Fielding? Singing Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band reprise as a tribute to the original Sergeant Pepper's album cover. So, did you follow all that? What else is there to say about this film? If you can believe it, producer Robert Stigwood envisioned the film as being that generation's gone with the wind. I kid you not. The only character with any dialogue is the narrator. While Mustard roamed through the building looking for strawberry. Everything else is just later era Beatles songs sung through the entire film. I'm fixing a hole where the rain gets in. And stop. This decision was made due to the Bee Gees and Frampton's British accents not making sense in a location set in the heart of America. But because of this, we don't grow attached to any of the characters and have no clue about any of their motivations. Michael Schultz directed the film, and at the time, this was the largest budget ever entrusted to an African-American director to that date. It's such a shame that it happened to be this movie. But if you want to know the real tragedy of all this, it's that the Beatles producer George Martin served as the film's musical director, conductor, arranger, and producer of the film's soundtrack. I consider George Martin, more than Brian Epstein, more than Pete Best, or even Billy Preston, to be the fifth Beatle. Don't at me. But here he's turned these beloved songs into kitschy, tacky music. Hey! They've all got this toothless disco flavor that makes them sound like a worse version of the Stars on 45 Beatles medley. And I really like disco music, particularly Italian disco, but man, I can truly see why people had disco sucks bumper stickers back in the 70s because the sound of these tracks is just truly the antithesis of rock and roll. I Needless to say, the film was panned mercilessly from the people involved in it to pretty much everyone else who saw The Wretched Thing, including New York Times columnist Janet Martin, who wrote, The musical numbers are strung together so mindlessly that the movie has the feel of an interminable variety show. Couldn't have put it better myself, Janet. George Harrison is the only Beatle to have publicly commented on the film, and when discussing the Bee Gees and Frampton, he mentioned, I think it's damaged their images, their careers, and they didn't need to do that. It's just like the Beatles trying to do the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones can do it better. So yeah, this is a total abomination. Do not watch it. Because the wind is high. So Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band really put the idea of a Beatles musical to bed for a few decades. But 30 years later, there was another attempt, and this time, it's actually good. That's right, next up is the bold and ambitious Across the Universe. Oh man, I love this movie. I was a Beatles diehard from an early age and similar to Nowhere Boy, I was really excited for this to come out. I caught it at the cinema when I was 16 years old and it was like just the best thing I'd ever seen. Director and costume slash puppet designer of Broadway's The Lion King, Julie Taymor, directed Across the Universe and her skill of handling beloved artist music is showcased here in an astounding way. Over 30 Beatles songs are used to tell the story of a group of young bohemians living in New York City in the 60s as they deal with political upheaval, the Vietnam War, the hippie counterculture movement, and falling in love. A lot of care and talent was put into making the music sound fresh and exciting not only for Beatles fans but to a new audience as well. Unlike many other movies from around that time and currently, it's largely devoid of any uninspired CGI and instead what we get is Tamil's talent for puppetry and inventive theatrics which really makes the film that much more charming. It's also shot on location, transforming New York City into a psychedelic and politically charged reflection of its former self. The film flopped at the box office, making back less than half of its $70 million budget, bucking the trend of other successful jukebox musicals from around the same time, such as Moulin Rouge and Mamma Mia. Maybe it was the lack of an exclamation point that did it. <laughs> The critics were polarized too, with many deriding its overly sanitized version of the 60s and called out the musical numbers as self-indulgent nostalgic whimsy for baby boomers. Meanwhile, others praised the bold and imaginative vision for the film, highlighting the brilliant choreography, animation, and puppetry. Paul McCartney was sitting next to Tamor at a screening, and when she asked him if there was anything he didn't like, he said, 
What's not to like? Ringo Starr, Yoko Ono, and Olivia Harrison also praised the film, and it's now reaching cult status amongst a growing fan base. But what makes this such a better movie musical than Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? Well, for one thing, it has interesting, fleshed out characters, and the songs actually sound good. These 33 Beatles numbers become the language of the film, and the story weaves around the different lyrics and sentiments that the songs create fully immersing yourself in this world of psychedelic 60s counterculture. It's everything that awful 70s fever dream wishes it were. So, what happens in Across the Universe? We open on a moody shot of Paul McCartney lookalike, Jim Sturgis, on the beach, singing the opening line of the song, Girl, to camera. All about the girl who came to stay. Letting us know exactly what the story is about, as we get a foreshadowing of the drama to come. I remember seeing the sequence where it transforms from the squeaky clean all American rendition of Hold Me Tight to the grungy Cavern Club version in Liverpool. You, you, you. I was just like, ah, oh, the duality of the Beatles music, mise en scène. I thought it was just the coolest thing. And you know what? I still do. This whole sequence slaps. This is where we meet Lucy, the girl in question. A young American high schooler with a boyfriend that gets shipped off to war. We also have Jude, the scrappy and charming lad from Liverpool. And where we see the first of many charming, if on the nose, Beatles references. When I'm 64, I'll be long gone from this place. Meanwhile, there's Prudence performing a rendition of I Wanna Hold Your Hand that she's actually not singing to the quarterback, but another cheerleader. You know Ryan Murphy was watching this and was just like, I'm gonna make this a TV show. Hey. So Jude leaves for America and jumps ship in the hope of finding his estranged father who works at Princeton University. We discover his dad's not some hotshot professor, but an aloof janitor who wants nothing to do with Jude. This is where we meet the troublemaker Max, who is helped out by Jude and the two sing with a little help from my friends and smoke an invisible joint. That's right, due to this film's PG-13 rating, this scene is being fully mined and none of these guys are smoking or even holding a joint because do you get it? He's getting high with a little help from his friends. Man, this is a very charming scene though. We'll never see these other guys again, but it's a fun first act number. Here we properly meet Lucy for the first time in all her second wave feminist glory, mentioning the narcissism of having children. People putting out little carbon copies of themselves going, oh look, doesn't he have his father's eyes? Doesn't he have his mother's lips? It's. That's disgusting. What about adoption? What follows is a cute number of her and her sisters singing It Won't Be Long. I'm so alone, now you're coming. Have you ever had to sing and dribble a basketball at the same time? Well, I guess Zac Efron has. But yeah, this is Lucy's MO in the film. She's Jude's love interest, but she's also the voice of radical social upheaval that becomes more prevalent throughout the 60s. Jude is then invited over to Thanksgiving dinner. Max turns out to be Lucy's sister. Their family are upper class snobs. And so they sing all my loving at a bowling alley and terrorize anyone who's ever worked in occupational health and safety. Jude and Max then leave for New York City where Max gently warns Jude that she's got a boyfriend. And he says, It's okay, I've got a girlfriend. They arrive at a bohemian walk up in the village. And here we meet Sadie, the Janis Joplin inspired soul singer who owns the place. And also where we get a Maxwell Silver Hammer reference. And again, could have murdered your granny with a hammer. The first of many. So did I mention that Lucy has a boyfriend? Well, she doesn't anymore. He dies and Jude's girlfriend is kind of just not mentioned after this, so that solves that problem. We then gear shift to a sequence of the Detroit race riots where a little boy who was later killed by police sings a soulful cover of Let It Be along with a gospel choir. Just quickly, this is one of those renditions of a Beatles track where you have to remind yourself that this isn't a traditional gospel song, but one written by a 27 year old white guy in the 60s. It's what makes this movie stand out above many others. They do a lot of justice with the music and contextualize it so well with the action. The parallel funerals of a young black boy killed by police and a young white soldier killed in a pointless war perfectly portrays the tensions of the 1960s and shows that even in the first 40 minutes of this film, we've already seen a lot of emotional range from the story and its characters. The boy who was killed has a brother, Jojo, an obvious parallel to Jimi Hendrix, so much so that he's later given the full Hendrix costume treatment. No way! Jojo sets off for New York City with a guitar slung across his back, while Joe Cocker sings Come Together as various New York characters such as a homeless man, a pimp, and a hippie. There's also this really great sequence of business dances before Jojo auditions to be Sadie's guitarist. Meanwhile, Jude's getting by through his art, selling it to a small record company. So Jojo's hanging out at the apartment when we see Prudence enter out of nowhere, apparently fleeing an abusive relationship. Jude explains to Sadie that she came in through the bathroom window. Perfect. Lucy leaves for New York City to join Max and they all attend Sadie's gig where she gives a very Joplin-esque rendition of Why Don't We Do It In The Road. Wow. We do it in the 
And Jude falls in love with her to her own slow cover of If I Fell. Max gets a letter from home indicating that he's been drafted in the war. What follows is, I think, the most effective sequence in the whole film, invoking the slogan from the Uncle Sam posters, I want you. A terrifying rendition of I Want You is performed by creepy dancing soldiers. We cut to Max and the other new recruits carrying the Statue of Liberty while they sing, She's so super creative interpretation of an otherwise obscure line from what is originally a sultry rock song about lust that becomes a frightening commentary on the Vietnam War. We discover that Prudence has a crush on Sadie and locks herself in a closet. This sequence is a reference to the original composition of this song by John Lennon, who wrote it in India on a meditation retreat that Mia Farrow's sister Prudence was also attending. Prudence got super into private meditation and was eventually coaxed out of her seclusion from Lennon and George Harrison, which inspired this track. Dear Prudence, won't you In Across the Universe, it's played as a sort of coming out song, as they are literally asking Prudence to come out to play. This transitions to a peace rally on the streets of Manhattan, which inspires Lucy to join a group of peace activists led by the revolutionary but shifty Paco. Sadie is coaxed into signing a record deal without Jojo, which is where we move into the Summer of Love section of the film with Dr. Robert, played by Bono. I am the Eggman. Kind of Ken Kesey, Neil Cassidy guru singing I Am The Walrus on a psychedelic bus directly inspired by Kesey's magic bus from the summer of 67 with some very 2007 visual effects added in. This whole middle section of the film is made to feel like you're dropping in and out of an acid trip. While the terms acid and LSD are never directly mentioned, Sadie does explain that they've arrived at the headquarters of the League of Spiritual Deliverance. They get denied entry and so they wander off and stumble across a strange circus led by Mr. Kite. What follows is an honestly irritating spoken word rendition of Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite performed by Eddie Izzard, who I normally like, but their performance here seems a little phoned in and the vocal improvisations just aren't charming. Late of Pablo Funk is fair. Have you seen it? It's great. They got stuff. The Blue Meanies. <laughs> Oh, sorry, the blue people and all the other incredible puppetry do do their best to save it though. Directly afterwards, we get another favorite sequence of mine where the gang are singing a sublime version of Because in a Field. <gasps> What I love about this is that it starts off completely a cappella, which enables us to hear all nine voices singing in unison. I love this decision to use nine people because the Beatles version of Because uses John, Paul and George's three-part harmony recorded three times to make nine voices in total. All I can say is please try to remember this version and not the one previously mentioned in this video. Because the world is round. <sighs> Guiding us into the post-trip come down is a gorgeous dude-led cover of something as he sketches Lucy. After this though, things start falling apart for the group as Max is off to Vietnam, Sadie breaks up with Jojo in favor of her burgeoning record deal, and Lucy spends all her time with Paco and the student activists, much to the chagrin of Jude, who's buried in his work at home. This leads to a melancholy version of Strawberry Fields Forever, where Jude goes full Jackson Pollock with a punnet of strawberries, and Max continues to experience the harsh brutality of war. The sequence, in my opinion, really does show the 2007 of it all. This in turn raises tensions amongst Jude and Lucy, which becomes Revolution, where Jude questions the validity of Paco's intentions. A shaga, a dong, one. And the revolution itself. Man, he gets so edgy here. I really like the way the song uses the all right bit at the end of the track to transition to Jude getting thrown out. Who then commiserates with Jojo as they sing a mournful while my guitar gently weeps. At the lowest point in the film, Sadie laments the awful sound of her new band and Jude returns home to an empty apartment and breaks down before he sings the title song of the movie. Across the universe. Spiced with a Sadie-led cover of Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. This climaxes with Jude trying to save Lucy during a clash with police in a scene reminiscent of the Berkeley student riots from around the same time. Jude gets bailed out of jail from his dad, but has discovered he's there illegally and gets shipped back off to Liverpool where he encounters his ex. What was the name? Who? The reason he stopped racing. 
and is a sad boy on the docks. Another impressive episode follows with Happiness is a Warm Gun, where the nonsensical first verse is depicted as Max's incoherent ramblings to Lucy. A soap impression of his wife, which he ate and donated to the National Trust. Before he gets happily injected by the warm gun in the form of morphine administered by multiple Selma Hayek's. A Jeff Beck cover of A Day in the Life plays over Jude reading the news today, and oh boy, the film starts to drag a little bit here. We get a melancholy blackbird followed by Hey Jude, which is where we start to see things turn around. This song was originally written to make someone feel better after a tough few months, and that's exactly what's happening here. Jude packs his bag and leaves for America again, this time legally, while the best drum solo of the whole film carries on in the background. Max and Jude reunite and head to Strawberry Jam Studios, which sets the scene for our final collection of songs. And we couldn't have a conclusion to a Beatles musical without a rooftop performance where I guess Sadie and Jojo work things out. They sing a soulful cover of Don't Let Me Down before the cops show up and the concert dissolves, but not before Jude emerges and sings All you need is love, love, love is all you need. Which brings back the gang and Jude finally sees Lucy on another rooftop where they gaze at each other as a chorus of Love Is All You Need closes out one heck of a film. Something you may notice about this film is that the first act is paired with early era Beatles songs, the second act with the middle psychedelic period of their tunes, and the final act contains many of their later career highlights. I love the decision to space out the songs like this as it emphasizes the Beatles' overall influence on the period. Although the Beatles don't seem to exist in this universe, what becomes clear is how inextricable their impact was on the world during the 60s and beyond. From their first tour in the US, where they requested unsegregated concerts during their tour in the American South. They said if there was going to be segregation of any kind, we're not going. We play the people. To influencing the entire hippie movement through their own pot and LSD induced music and experiences. To particularly John Lennon preaching peace and fighting to end the war towards the end of the decade. The Beatles were not only the sound of the 60s, Rather, the 60s were the way they were because of the Beatles. I think that's the major takeaway for me from this film. It may be a little cheesy and indulgent in parts, but I love that Julie Tamor went big and masterfully told the story of the 60s through the biggest thing in pop culture at the time. It may be a slightly sanitized telling of what was a tumultuous decade, but it's a jukebox musical for God's sake. No one goes to a musical to get a nuanced deep dive of socio-political issues. Or they try and fail and the musical is called Rent. <laughs> You see a musical to enjoy the story and the music, and this aforementioned music really sounds fantastic. There are so many wonderful performances of Beatles classics in this film. I'm not saying they're better than the original, but so many of these songs are arranged and produced with such love and creativity that they breathe new life into the Beatles discography and allow for new audiences to experience the Fab Four's genius, perhaps for the first time. This movie is a wonderful, feel-good celebration of the Beatles' astounding legacy and will always hold a special place in my heart. Now the final film I want to talk about is also set in a world where the Beatles don't exist, but in my opinion it's nowhere near as effective at celebrating their genius musical legacy. I'm of course talking about Yesterday. However, I have so much to say about this film that I realized it would require its own video to truly explore how bizarre, nonsensical, and profoundly botched this film is. So please hit subscribe so you'll be the first to know when it comes out because it's going to be a doozy. All right, that's it for now. Please like the video if you enjoyed it and let me know in the comments which of these films is your favorite. Do you disagree with anything I said here? I would love to know. Anyway, my name's Elliot. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Wow.